There isn't a single book to be described as a personal development all-time classic. While differently, we find various approaches as more or less efficient and everyone has their favorites. Despite that, I believe that the one I'm about to discuss tops many lists of fitting the description titles. No, it really isn't Think Grow Rich, though they usually go hand to hand and it certainly comes from the same author. Called Outwitting the Devil, this, written by Napoleon Hill absolute masterpiece, was one of those to literally blow my mind when I read slash listened to them first. Because of that, I decided to do something I always wanted. Review the book by slightly interpreting and commenting on the stuff in it I find most inspiring. While that includes plenty, to be maximally concise, I'll keep it under 12,000 words total, including the quotes, and address the following subjects. 1. The Devil and His Weapons and Devices 2. The Reasons Why the Book Got Published in 2011 3. The Habit of Drifting 4. The Hypnotic Rhythm 5. Self-Discipline and the Forming It Faculties 6. The definite chief aim and the definiteness of purpose. 7. The other self and the infinite intelligence. Before starting, however, I think it is only right to do this disclaimer first. Like any other by Napoleon Hill, outwitting the devil was meant to be studied and not just read. Approached in that manner, the book builds within us a growing with our life experiences perception. So what I do in the following paragraphs is presenting my version of that. Nothing more, nothing less. Meaning I by no means pretend to be an authority on Hill's philosophy and teachings and neither on any of the subjects of discussion. I merely have a hunch that other like-minded individuals may somehow benefit from my understanding, experiences and thoughts. Having that said, please fasten your seatbelts, do not expect linear thinking, appreciate my work for what it is, and let's begin. The Devil and His Weapons and Devices Not limited to a physical body, Hill's devil is best described as a preoccupying one half of the atom, the universe and especially the people's mind's energy, yours including. Where he dwells is in those portions of the mind one not only doesn't utilize but often isn't aware that they actually exist. Yes, rather than controlling planets and stars, the devil is all about turning people into his causes pawns. How he does that is through multiple ways, yet the various forms of fear appear as best serving his initiative. That of converting people into not thinking nor acting for themselves drifters. Quote, One of my cleverest devices for mind control is fear. I plant the seed of fear in the minds of people and as these seeds germinate and grow, through use I control the space they occupy says the devil on page 61. What he also states is that though there are six forms of fear, those of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love, old age and death, the first and the last are the handiest for controlling people. Having a grip on 98% of them through fear, he turns their lives on earth into a living hell. A common way he does that is by instilling the totally wrong fear-based belief that there's nothing but eternal punishment after this life. Despite furthest from the truth, the last saps people's independent thought, this makes them a less possession of their own minds. An excellent example of a non-drifter, the devil doesn't waste time but rather swiftly takes advantage of that, and this is when the person's real hell begins. You see, the devil never really planned on taking anyone's soul after that. 
Instead, he intends to make people fear that or something else. What else? Well, that, such as whether or not the thing is actually real, is of absolutely no importance. Because the truth of the matter is that fearing something not real is just as destructive as fearing one that actually is. Knowing it better than anyone, the devil merely quadruples on that and then lets the chips fall where they may. The Young Taking control over the young is one of the devil's highest priorities. The reason being is because that never lets people begin doing their own thinking nor develop themselves into definite, independently acting human beings. Or in other words, into what Napoleon Hill describes as non-drifters and students of the great university of life. The only one capable of teaching them their definite chief aim. In all of its forms, however, fear really isn't the single tool utilized by the devil for breaking the young's will. For that he also employs four other devices. A. Self-destructive habits. B. Religion, including its churches and leaders. C. School teachings. And D. Their own parents. Self-destructive habits. Even that self-destructive habits come in couples and work as a magnet for each other, it is safe to say that the devil puts some extra efforts in turning youngsters into smokers, or, as he likes to say, into making them join his two packs a day club. Though far from being the single self-destructive habit, smoking plays a role very substantial in the entire devil's scheme. What it does, besides destroying the person's will, vitality and health, is that it opens doors for the whole gamut of self-destructive habits. Page 66, Napoleon Hill asks the devil, quote, Which do you consider to be your greater tool for gaining control of human minds? Cigarettes or liquor? Then the devil answers, Without hesitation, I would say cigarettes. Once I get a young person to join my two-package-a-day club, I have no trouble in inducing that person to take on the habit of liquor, overindulgence of sex, and all other related habits which destroy the independence of thought and action. Now, let me stop reviewing for a moment and share an exciting real-life story. Personal Experience 1 Being a school despising, household issues facing, fearful and very insecure child, I began smoking in third grade. While months later I already masturbated up to 10 and often even more times a day, soon I also got into drinking. Matter of fact, I not only got into it, but also got into the toxicology because of poisoning myself with it a few times in fifth grade. Despite I never felt that woe to even consider listening to a pickup artist, I quickly became obsessed with dating sex particularly. Meaning that having more of the lust turned into my number one priority. Right around that time a daily bag of weed came into place. Then speed came into place. And then Well then, my already well-developed habit of mixing different liquors, namely beer and gin or rum, almost killed me on several occasions when 17 and 18. Now, please, pay even closer attention. After a decade as a smoker and months of planning it inspired by my mom's death, I stopped smoking in a day. As if by magic, During the next year, I also entirely gave up drugs and guess what happened then? I quit booze, though that happened after months of some real struggle. I mean, like, really real. Years later, in 2013, I did the same with fapping and the misuse of sex, hence started seeing and utilizing the water for what it truly is. The most potent driving force in our lives, or as explained on page 191, 
the strongest dominating desire or motive to inspire most of all human endeavors and, of course, the nature's most useful therapeutic force. Finally, in 2014, I gave up sugar, junk and frequent meals and in the following year fully adopted the one meal a day eating pattern. Now, let's get back to the review. Why the book was published in 2011? No, I had no idea of who Napoleon Hill was for that whole period. In spite of that, my little story is some concrete evidence that he was unbelievably ahead of his time. So ahead to be well aware of some only recently discovered groundbreaking information. Somehow he knew that identically to sugar, smoking also causes what modern science describes as a gateway effect. In other words, it makes the brain want to receive more stimulation from other much stronger substances. Known as cross-sensitization, as earlier stated, that basically is a door-opening process for more and harsher addictions. Quite impressive, or isn't it? The more fascinating, if you ask me, is that Outwitting the Devil was actually written in 1938. Not just around 50 years before the world started opening its eyes for the truth about smoking, but also about 20 before tobacco companies started using quote-unquote scientists to advertise it as a weight loss, health, well-being and even athleticism promoting habit. Yeah, that actually happened back in the 60s, but if you don't believe me, then be shocked to the core after googling some of the cigarette ads from that era. And then, maybe repeat the process for the mainly designed for women, speed-based medications. In my humble opinion, things like that, and of course, the author's outstanding perception of our society and human nature in general, majorly contributed to his initial decision of not publishing the book. I do believe that while the rest of his work is kinda more readily comprehensible and far less dark, outwitting the devil may require a bit higher level of maturity. Not only from the so-called non-controlled by the devil 2%, but also from the society as a whole. Supposedly, for that now allows the fast information transfer we get to enjoy because of the internet. So I guess... That's one of the reasons why the book got finally published in 2011. Seeing it as nothing but a perfect synchronicity, to me, the timing couldn't be more ideal. Yet, that isn't solely because of the provided by the web free access to knowledge and ability to double and even triple check everything for ourselves. That is only the good part. What I am referring to is also the tremendous pressure modern culture and way of living put on the individual. Permanently distracted from his or her's definite chief aim, now the last chances of becoming a non-drifter are greatly diminished. And what that brings us to is a devil's device not less harmful than the already discussed. Propaganda. Page 108. The Devil Speaks. Quote. Propaganda is any device, plan or method by which people can be influenced without knowing that they're being influenced or the source of influence. End quote. Later on the same, he also explains that thanks to propaganda, he is ahead in the process of obtaining control over and even Hitlerizing America. While since not based there, I can't really speak for the water, I have the profound sense that he already succeeded in doing the first. Not only to the US, but to the entire world. How that happened was mainly through social media, which often appears as Web 2.0's worst side effect. While in previous times, ignoring someone's propaganda was possible and way more encouraged, that really is no longer the case. Now, instead of only religious, political, and of various products and services, propaganda is literally unavoidable and about everything and anything. It's on phones, tablets and computers, on the billboards and in every commercial and song you hear. 
In fact, for the most part, there really isn't that much difference between those two categories. Propaganda tells you what you should like, strive for and spend on, who you should hang and have sex with. Defining success and happiness for you, it says what your true life purpose should be. Last but not least, propaganda provides a countless number of opinions to loosely express on any subject, regardless of whether or not you researched and have any experience with it. Maybe in former eras all that was kinda optional. You were able to switch off the TV, to not listen to the radio and to never read the newspapers and magazines. Now things are different and propaganda is omnipresent. Permanently influencing all aspects of the environment, it manufactures not solely the American, but the global drifting glorifying culture slash matrix. Known as consumerism, to me, the last kinda seems as a mutated version of the devil's web. And that is another reason why Hill's masterpiece isn't just timeless, but also published right on time. During an era when needed more than ever. Family and religion. An excellent point the book makes is that rather than helping people advance spiritually, Religion continues frightening them with the devil, thus keeps spreading and even being the source of fear of him. While he surely wanted us to consider that, there are some much more critical things to be deciphered in those sections. Or at least, I think there are. The first is that rather than referring to all, the author covertly specifies the three big organized religions. While we all know what some of them did during the medieval ages, what they still do now is incomparably much worse than scaring people with an imaginary devil. They force individuals into a strictly dictated by their churches fear-based relationship with God. Denying human's divine aspect, that prevents establishing the most potent and direct link with infinite intelligence one could ever have. Another known fact is that organized religion also suppresses sex and free expression of will. Now, let's stop for a moment and remind ourselves of something extremely substantial. Namely, that while according to the author, those two combined elevate one to high states of genius, according to Freud and others, suppressing them is actually the root cause of all mental illnesses. Besides that, organized religion doesn't allow people to discover and put in use their mind's vast capabilities. So rather than providing the tools and tactics for reducing them, it seems like it aims to enlarge the unoccupied spaces in one's mind. The same in which is already covered is where the devil dwells. By proclaiming an abusive father figure as the god to be worshipped and feared by all, They deny not just half of the humanity's significance and equality, but also one of the most ageless concepts to ever exist. That of Mother Nature. And guess what? Whether or not you believe in him really doesn't matter. In fact, it doesn't matter even if you are an atheist, because society's core structure is organized to be mainly dominated by the same. So, does this make him real? Well, not really, but he is definitely a wife. Where he lives is in all institutions and authority figures, created to be feared by people and prevent independent thinking. They include not just school, but also the family. Page 79, The Devil Speaks, quote, One of my favorite tricks is to coordinate the efforts of parents and religious instructors so they work together in helping me destroy children's power to think for themselves. I use many religious instructors to undermine the courage and power of independent thought of children by teaching them to fear me, but I use parents to aid the religious leaders in this great work of mine." End quote. No, I really don't believe that to control their children, parents somehow collaborate with religious instructors especially not in most cases nowadays. 
What I do believe, however, is that the family is strategically preconceptualized to operate as an extension of organized religion. How that's done is through the artificially created yet ever-present dogma that while both parents are equally important, or sorta, the head of the family is only the father. Who the child, more important than loving, has to prove something to, be accepted by, and though not always officially declared, fear. What I think this completely unjustified, in my humble opinion, this balance of forces does, is something quite detrimental. Planting the seed of fear in the child's mind when least developed and before anything else by making it assume a very specific stereotype. That of fearing the obviously preferred by the male godfather figure which later extends through school and all institutions. That, however, isn't to say that organized religion has that much control like in previous times, but that the society and the governments merely inherited slash employed its methods for mass control through fear and, of course, through breaking one's will when weakest and most vulnerable. Last but not least, here we cannot skip addressing the habit of imitation. The same describes the children's natural inclination of imitating others at the time when their consciousness is described by the book as a blank and absorbs pretty much everything like a sponge. That includes adopting the wrong, leading to drifting emotions, habits, thoughts and activities from parents, peers, teachers and religious instructors. What happens is that the same spheres, negativity, flaws and self-destructive habits automatically get applied to the children's character. The more that happens, the more children's definiteness goes south and with that their ability to differentiate temporary defeat from failure and create their own environment. School Rather than stimulating children of using their minds to become their best versions, the school makes them adopt a slavish mentality and contaminates it with utterly useless information. The even more depressing, however, is that it does that for 12 or more years and apparently that blocks the independent thought from occurring. The actual device for unlocking and putting in charge the other self, who will extensively examine by this review sent. Pages 168 and 169. Quote. Question. Why aren't children taught definiteness of purpose in the public schools? Answer. For the reason that there is no definite plan or purpose behind any of the school curricula. Children are sent to school to make credits and learn how to memorize, not to learn what they want out of life. The only thing of enduring value to any human being is working knowledge of his mind. The churches do not permit a person to inquire into the possibilities of his own mind and the schools do not recognize that such a thing as mind exists. End quote. What that tells us is that school teaches pretty much everything but that which worth studying. How to make the best use of your mind Thus, utilize it as a tool for getting out of life what you want on your own terms. Whether or not that's because of the set by organized religion tone, I cannot confirm. What I think, however, are two things. The first is that school's primary discipline slash intent, that of teaching people how to purposelessly memorize facts, is a mere camouflage for its severely mind-crippling and often damaging activity. Wasting people above a decade of exceptionally quality time. What I am referring to here isn't solely that school teachings lack any practical slash real life application, but also that this is a period when building any useful skill or habit is actually the easiest. The mind is still young, still not cluttered with the eventually coming with age and in all walks of life burden. Nor with the previously covered propaganda and discouragement many people tend to get from their peers, often parents and school teachers. 
Therefore, we can assume that the mind is ready to absorb the right information when most needed. Why most needed? Well, because if provided on time, it could not only make one begin growing as the right decisions making non-drifter, but also prevent series of mistakes we all more or less make, help better cope with the challenging puberty and pretty much whatever comes next. Considering mine and the experiences of others, I have no doubts that for that time frame, education may entirely annihilate one's inherent love and desire for self-improvement. The second thing is that school also massively fails in making people memorize. Where that becomes evident is when the devil explains the hypnotic rhythm's idiosyncrasies. Namely, that in order to become permanent, thoughts absolutely must have some emotional value to the person. Despite not literally said, I don't think something different applies to random facts and even real-life events, especially when they also aren't of any use to the person. Yet, to conclude that, we really don't need to read the book, but to merely remember the old saying, use it or lose it. Personal experience too. Perhaps different people have different experiences with school. That, however, doesn't change the fact that I never ever met a person to anyhow be emotionally attached to any of the studied in the school material and neither want to remember more than 5% of it. And that, believe it or not, is despite that I changed the total of six schools. Five public and one private. Oh, and one university. Now, let me finish this section with a small passage from another brilliant mind and favorite lecturer of mine. One who just like Napoleon Hill also read lectures in Carnegie Hall. Manly P. Hall. Quote, When intelligence fails, security fails. How are you going to get that intelligence? Well, for a long time, we thought we could get it by education, but this is becoming increasingly doubtful. The trouble with education is that it assists us to adjust to what is wrong, but does not attempt to correct the errors. Therefore, education says the world's as it is, adjust to it or suffer. Therefore, education gives us various instructions on how to make the best out of the bad bargain we call life. It helps us to have a trait or art and whenever something new comes along, education works it over until it becomes obsolete. For a long time, we've been training people for special fields of activity which generally cease to be important by the time the training is complete. So all these situations have impelled us to realize that education is not giving us the internal resource necessary to control ourselves. End quote. Coping with mental and emotional depression lecture by Manly Palmer Hall. Flattery. Described by the devil as a deadly instrument, flattery takes a special place in his arsenal. The reason being is that it efficiently converts into drifters both adults and children. Where flattery's power comes from are two of the human nature's most common faults, vanity and egotism. Since everyone has them to some extent, no one's immune to flattery, and that doesn't change throughout the person's entire life. In fact, Though far less active, those never entirely disappear but somehow remain even when he or she is definite and devoted to self-growth. Also important is that when properly utilized, flattery becomes a powerful weapon. One for gaining control over others. Compared to a pulling rope, according to the book, in women the same works on their vanity but in men on their egotism. However. I think that in our global ego-tripping culture and era, both genders crave flattery not just more than ever, but also in a very identical manner. So let me extrapolate on that with the following. Flattery's effectiveness is hidden within people's insatiable thirst for validation. 
It provides us with something even the best of us secretly yet desperately desire or even badly crave. The fake assurance or illusion that we are or get closer to become our idealized selves. More on that by the review sent. Intoxicating as those produced by drugs, that could be seen as a real high to bring the worst off and make us delusional about our own places in life. Or at least it surely can as long as the person bites the so-called chief bait and trusts the flatterer's words. Therefore, begins living with the mentality that they're accurate and actually mean something. Personal Experience 3 As an imperfect human being and a male, I do notice myself getting severely flattered in various ways. Yes, that likely begins with the recognition of some personal achievements or things I do well, especially when coming from the same or similar situation having individuals. Not less, however, it extends to that of my physique and appearance. Above gender, this I believe is relatable to anyone who takes care of his or herself and has some honesty. Intended as a constructive encouragement, flattery often ends up being nothing but shallow compliments. Easy to be spotted right on time, they are commonly given on superficial aspects of one's conduct. When seriously taken, they unnoticeably corrupt the person's character, and how they do it is by empowering the worst and least controlled aspects of his or her's ego. The Habit of Drifting Anyone who read the book knows that the thus far covered are nothing but few of the devil's tools. His purpose for using them, however, is ensnaring people into what he calls drifting. When the author figured that out, was in the process of developing the success philosophy for Andrew Carnegie. Why I think Carnegie asked him to do that was because of two reasons. A. To provide people with a system for overcoming the Great Depression back in the 1920s and B. Because he somehow knew that Napoleon Hill wasn't just the best, but likely the only capable of completing the mission. The last required about 20 years of researching, peculiarly of the spectrum of things making the total of 25,000 people either successful or not. What their thorough examination led Hill to was another major insight. Namely, the 12 specific faculties were present in the characters of the first, the habit of drifting was mutual to all others, hence appeared as the leading cause of their fate. Although drifting encompasses quite many things, I do believe that the following few describe it accurately enough. The inability to act and think independently. The lack of well-defined vision for the wanted out of life and all things. The absence of enthusiasm and initiative. The laziness of utilizing the brain and the body as mighty devices for obtaining the desired. That includes permanent eating, malnutrition and unhealthy living. Of course, the misuse of sexual energy and making poor choices with one's intimate partners or even worse getting into marriage or relationship with them. Drifting also is self-doubt, indecisiveness and procrastination. It's negligence, denial, suppression and the fear of accepting aspects of one's self, something I more extensively address by the review sent. It's letting one's existence be dominated by circumstances, thus not aiming for what aligns with one's true purpose but satisfying with whatever wife randomly throws at one. That isn't to say that drifting includes some form of radical acceptance or exercising what Nietzsche calls amor fati and striving to find equal amounts of ecstasy in both pleasures and suffering. It is to say that one's too lazy and distracted to take action and obtain control. Last but not least, and likely the worst, not even bothering to discover one's true will or definite chief aim. Apparently, all that could be summed up by saying this. 
Drifting is the total opposite of following Hill 7 principles of spiritual, mental and physical freedom. 1. Definiteness of purpose. 2. Mastery over self. 3. Learning from adversity. 4. Controlling environmental influence and associations. 5. Giving permanency to positive rather than negative thought habits and developing wisdom. 6. Harmony. Acting with definiteness of purpose to become the dominating influence in your own mental, spiritual and physical environment. 7. Caution. Thinking through your plan before you act. While the first six are somewhat addressed throughout the whole review, I'll suggest the following about the seventh. Think of the internet gurus who yell at you to mindlessly take action. To do it without considering all possible outcomes, nor if there are ways to actually be more efficient with it. And neither whether or not this particular action won't only waste time and efforts while eventually burning you out. When doing so, also imagine that Napoleon Hill sits next to you. Then ask yourself if he would agree that blindly executing on what those people say is an example of thinking and acting on your own initiative or he would sooner suggest it's the total opposite. A mere obedience to some unnecessary pressure created by a modern and very potent form of propaganda. If a creator then specifically think of those telling you to continuously push content regardless of whether or not you deliver value and show and develop any skills, authenticity and style. Personal Experience 4 Why I'm bringing this? Well, because as a creator I drifted quite a bit listening to those guys. Yes, there was a period when that actually happened. Can you even imagine? Rather than improving my delivery, knowledge base, editing and filming, I only embarrassed myself quite a bit, burned out and wasted time. Time I could surely invest researching, learning about gear and developing those faculties, hence into becoming an actually better creator and not a merely frequent uploader. Pages 73, 152 and 223 Quotes When a person begins drifting on any subject, he is headed straight towards the gates of what you earthbound call hell. Once any person hesitates, procrastinates or becomes indefinite about anything, he is just one step removed from my control. Drifting is nothing but a negative state of mind. A state of mind conspicuous by its emptiness of purpose. End quote. Based on all of them, I'll end discussing the subject of drifting with this little conclusion. The set regarding self-destructive habits could be also easily applied to the various forms of drifting. Never alone, but always working as a magnet for each other. A critical point the book makes is that not really the devil but their different combinations is what turns life into a real hell. As mentioned, that happens here and now in this reality and when it all begins is pretty much immediately after the person is born. Hypnotic Rhythm Depicted as nature's way of balancing the universe, the hypnotic rhythm is neither good nor bad but instead serves a very peculiar function that of making things permanent, or as I like to call it, of automating them. Supposedly, you may think of hypnotic rhythm as the supreme archangel or even the god of that. While it doesn't create anything, nothing already existing can stay out of its influence. So, to be correctly understood, hypnotic rhythm must be recognized as almighty, infinite, twofold power. One which can be both detrimental and extremely beneficial and that is something to entirely depend on who you are and how you live. As stated in the book, rhythm is habit's final stage, the one at which the was becomes so concretely maintained that it can no longer be broken. 
Since from that point there really isn't much you can do, the key is not attempting the not possible, avoiding hypnotic rhythms ubiquity, but using it to your own advantage, hence as the mightiest tool for adopting the best serving your definite chief aim habits, thoughts and practices. Also compared to a whirlpool, hypnotic rhythm can be taken as pulling force. To make it permanently fixed, it pulls one towards whatever he or she has been doing for a while. For example, guess what will happen if you eat frequent meals and junk, do not exercise, watch porn and overindulge in sex, do drugs, get drunk, listen to pickup artists, fill your mind with negative thoughts, waste time on social media and do that for long enough. Inevitably, all those will become concretely fixed, irreplaceable parts of your identity. You will become them and they will become you. Meaning you will eventually reach a point to no longer be capable of breaking free from them. When that moment comes, you may ask. Well, what helped me answer this question were two things. A. Mine and many others life experiences and B the emerging body of scientific studies done on willpower. What they made me realize was the truth about the lust. Namely, that regardless of what the gurus and motivational speakers say, and just like the number of one's daily decisions, willpower is indeed a very limited resource. Bearing in mind that incredibly substantial piece of information, to my understanding, that moment occurs when breaking the vicious cycle requires amounts of willpower far exceeding those one possesses. Apparently, they increase over time and the longer people do something, the more permanent slash automated it becomes, hence the more challenging, less possible, breaking free from it gets. Now, while those were the bad news, there are also some great to be as equally valid. So let's continue with a couple of quotes to hopefully encourage you to take full advantage of hypnotic rhythm. Pages 132 and 6. Quote, Through this same wall of hypnotic rhythm, nature will also fix permanently positive thoughts of opulence and prosperity. Perhaps you'll better understand the working principle of hypnotic rhythm if I tell you it's nature's way to fix all habits permanently, whether they are mental or physical. If your mind fears poverty, your mind will attract poverty. If it demands opulence and expects it, your mind will attract the physical and financial equivalents of opulence. This is in accordance with an immutable law of nature. There is no reason why a non-drifter would want to avoid the influence of hypnotic rhythm because that law is favorable to him. It helps him convert his dominating aims, plans and purposes into their physical replicas. It fixes habits of thought and makes them permanent. Now, let's imagine the opposite. You stop wasting your sexual energy, begin using it to serve your definite chief aim Jumpstart OMAD and eating healthy, such as working out daily. Also quit booze and drugs if you do any. Stop letting social media influencers or anyone else dictate your culture, desires and taste. And most persistently, yet silently, start pushing towards whatever you want. Just like in the previous, in this case, the hypnotic rhythm will eventually take over. Then, those things will become who you are. And guess what? Once that happens, you'll no longer need to rely on willpower to sustain them, though some might be required during the earliest stages. Then, imagining your wife otherwise will start feeling super difficult and if for the sake of seeing what is going to happen, you force yourself to not do them, everything will seem utterly wrong. And that is precisely what I think the time principle or giving permanency to positive rather than negative thought habits is all about. Another thing to be found on several occasions 
is that thoughts of poverty and negativity discourage independent and accurate thought. But ones of opulence and material goods have the totally opposite, extremely beneficial effect. That of stimulating independent thinking while attracting the water. Because of that, I'd like to suggest something that brought me tremendous value. A little suggestion. One. Going beyond just aiming for the right kinds of thoughts in your day-to-day life, but also finding time to deliberately combine them with some deep relaxation, stillness and breath control. In other words, doing the whole thing as a meditation and part of your daily spiritual practice or hygiene. Performing whatever else the water encompasses and before or after that, utilizing some fourfold breathing while staying still and envisioning yourself already possessing the desire. What that brings us to is something essential to pretty much the entire New Thought tradition. Namely, that it teaches the student to operate with a mindset of having the goal already achieved. Whatever that means to you, it's a method which this simple exercise tremendously helps with. All you need is A. Doing it every day. B. Being definite and at least somehow realistic. And C. Not keeping up with the Joneses, nor thinking of material goods to possess, mainly to flex on someone else. Rather than wasting efforts envisioning cool yet totally impractical stuff like having six chains on, invest the time to see and most importantly feel yourself living in abundance of two kinds of things. Once to optimize your brain and body, thus your health, performance and life quality and others to not just help you improve but actually to reach absolute excellence with your skills, talents and crafts. What I'm saying is embed in your mind the perception of having not liabilities but more of the right assets. Know that only them and not the luxuries are what will help you do your best when executing on this quote. Quote Be willing to render useful service equivalent to the value of material things you demand of life and render the service first. End quote Self-discipline slash mastery. Page 186. Quote. One must gain mastery over self. This is the second of the seven principles. The person who is not master of himself can never be master of others. Lack of self-mastery is of itself the most destructive form of indefiniteness. End quote. It is no wonder why the entire 10th chapter is dedicated to self-discipline. Fundamental to any level of personal development and, in my humble opinion, biohacking, the same mainly boils down to mastering the three basic appetites. Those for food, sexual expression and giving loosely organized opinions. So let's examine each and then cover what happens when you master all three. Food. Pages 187 and 8. Quote. The majority of people are so weak in self-discipline they fill their stomachs with combinations of rich food which please the taste but overwork the organs of digestion and elimination. End quote. Once more, Napoleon Hill was far ahead of his time. What he also knew was something which, mostly due to functional medicine, science started considering only the last one or two decades. Namely, that there's a massive correlation between one's eating habits and his or her mood and emotions and mental and physical performance. Equal to permanent food poisoning, improper or conventional eating is in fact the root cause of the vast majority of illnesses and according to the book, headaches. Called oral intoxication, It tremendously overtaxes the whole system while filling one sewer with a compared to a deadly poison waste. Besides sick, that makes the person physically sluggish and mentally irritable and fussy. The author also figured out that what we now call highly palatable 
or increased palate complexity having products are in fact those to be most poisonous and addictive, therefore the first to stay away from when mastering the desire for food. What are those? Well, how about most people's favorite, loaded with chemicals, trans fats and processed sugars junk? Although nowadays we describe them through more complex and peculiar terms, I believe Hill's rich food combinations does just that, yet in a simple, more comprehensible to the average person way. A little suggestion too. To really heal yourself from the described sickness, hence overcome the desire for food, you have to A. Eliminate cravings and bury your hunger, and B. Develop a new relationship with food. No, willpower doesn't help. What does, however, is applying the provided in my 4 and 5 years of fasting and OMAD videos and articles information. Take that from a person who despite was a full addict, now successfully eats OMAD for almost 7 years, while sometimes enjoys up to 2 weekly 48 hour fasts. 6. Page 189. Quote. Question. How one can master the emotion of sex? Answer. By the simple process of transmuting that emotion into some form of activity other than copulation. Sex is one of the greatest of all forces which motivate human beings. Because of this fact, it is also one of the most dangerous forces. If humans would control their sex desires and transmute them into a driving force with which to carry on their occupation, that is, if they spent on their work one half of the time they dissipate in pursuit of sex, they would never know poverty. End quote. Deserving a separate review, this section teaches us how to avoid one of the most self-destructive mistakes. Neglecting to understand and master the desire for sex. Rather than suppressed or allowed to follow its natural course, the same must be A. Recognized as one of the most potent driving and healing forces and B. Channeled towards productive outlets. What that means is operating as an alchemist and turning the desire for mere physical expression into one for personal achievement vitality, excellent life quality and all the magic that comes with them. Or, as written in the Kibalion, transforming the non-desirable into what's worthy does triumph. Letting the might of your non-physically experienced orgasms spill over and while turning you into a far better person immensely optimize all aspects of your existence. Yes, that does include feeding your ambition to go as many extra miles getting the one that requires, thinking accurately and keeping your mind fertile for new ideas, your body capable of executing on them, a truly magnetic, attractive personality, an antidote to fear and discouragement and of course tremendously empowering your other self. No, not thinking that sex is vulgar, nor doing as organized religion says, thus attempting to deny or eliminate this want, but seeing it as pure and even divine, while ensuring it is for the right things. In other words, not craving orgasms, more sex and intimate partners, and neither doing what modern culture says, thus seeing those as your source or way of validation and self-worth. Rather than wasting it, you want to experience the same desire but for accomplishing whatever you want, keeping yourself healthy on top of your game, leaving your definite chief aim. Or at least for steadily moving towards that as you gradually increase your highest genius influence on your day-to-day -day consciousness. More on that by the review sent. Napoleon Hill and Jung. Here I'd like to suggest that when addressing the sexual desire or libido, Napoleon Hill recognizes it not that much in Freudian but in a more Jungian way. Meaning that rather than entirely sexual, to him 
This actually is a psychic energy. One manifesting in a great variety of directions, including the wife itself. Expressed in instinct, function and desire, it interchanges and transforms. Varying in direction, intensity and aim, it animates in all conscious purpose as a creative principle of life. Based on my research, I'll also suggest that both Jung and Napoleon Hill would greatly agree that the inception of every remarkable art piece, scientific discovery, invention or successful business or product is more or less originated by this same energy. When wasted or inappropriately utilized, however, its incredible potency leads to a series of adversities. Starting with a deprived of magnetism unattractive personality that encompasses things like laziness, lack of perseverance and definiteness, absence of drive and enthusiasm, creativity depletion, all sorts of drifting and diminished ability to self-heal. The last includes both the mind and the body. Though not taught in school and usually skipped by parents, correctly understanding and using sex is just as substantial as doing the same with nutrition and keeping your sewer clean. To find more about sex transmutation, I suggest checking my 4 and 5 years of nofab videos and articles, such as the one called How to Transmute Your Sexual Energy. Loosely organized opinions. Page 194, quote, The habit of expressing loosely organized opinions is one of the most destructive. This destructiveness consists in its tendency to influence people to guess instead of searching for the facts when they form opinions, create ideas and organize plans, end quote. As destructive as the former two, this mainly encompasses three things. 1. Openly talking about your plans and goals. Here the book notes that wise people keep their plans and ideas to themselves, or in other words, they move in silence. Besides preventing others from interfering with your schemes, as written on page 195, that if you ask me, also spares facing plenty of greed, envy and hatred. Regrettably, people don't want you to succeed. To prevent it from happening, they attempt to discourage you and how they commonly do it is with more loosely organized opinions. By keeping your mouth shut and eliminating that possibility, you do a favor to both, you and the others. Why is that is because you are not giving them a reason to feel insecure and angry nor filled with other negative emotions. 2. Giving your opinions without being asked for them. The chief motive behind this one is the craving for attention and impressing others. Blind to the possibility of embarrassment, the same is commonly triggered by one's vanity and egotism. Thus, it could be examined as an actual craving for flattery. 3. Though not stated in this exact manner, freely discussing or commenting on subjects you really don't comprehend, never researched slash done your homework on and neither have any experience with. What that does is making you perceive the world through random guessing and not real information and facts. Wants to be either based on science real-life experiences and common sense, or ideally, on a combination of them all. No, I do not have a written on this article. Despite that, to my mind come a few suggestions to help you master it. 1. Move in silence slash secrecy. Therefore, do not inform anyone about your goals and deepest desires. Instead, let others speak and patiently listen. 2. Before discussing it, research a subject or topic as much as possible. If there's any scientific evidence behind it, then always consider the latest. However, do not allow that to replace your common sense. Sometimes, science also makes mistakes. Remember the cigarette ads from the 60s, such as Ansel Keys and the fear of saturated fat. If possible, test things for yourself 
and be your own scientific study. Learn about as many others using the same approach and base your opinion on all that. The same give only when asked for it and to the selected few. By the latter I mean A. Once you can actually help and want to do so and B. Others to hopefully provide you with some more valuable insights. What happens when you master all three? Unlike others, I really don't believe that disciplining yourself is the outcome of all that, or at least not in the world's traditional sense. Before continuing, however, I'd like to note that my perspective is of a person who, as mentioned, is never hungry, nor eats more than once per day, does no fap for above six years, seldom ejaculates, and whether or not I have the third, I'm leaving you to decide on your own. Now let's continue. We've been told that discipline is required for achieving anything. While having it kinda makes us unstoppable and could be an all-problem solution, it seems like that without it, we are basically lost. Although I cannot disagree with any of that, there is a critical detail most of the discipline advocates sorta tend to omit. One I luckily figured out on my own journey and with modern science and this book's tremendous help. Namely, that as mighty as it is, discipline is a lot like a powerful engine. To run not just optimally, but in fact at all, it does require fuel. Meaning that without the last, discipline is a lot like a car with no gas. It doesn't go anywhere and that is regardless of how fast it could be. What happens when you master all three isn't that forcing yourself to do so and so completely and utterly against your will and desires somehow becomes easy. It is that you unlock slash make readily available an ocean of those fuels. When that happens, even partially, like in the cases of only eating OMAD or for instance, doing NOFAP, people start reporting having superpowers. So, do they really have some? No, they do not. It's just that rather than wasting, they begin cultivating and using powers already given them by nature. The same which, mostly due to modern culture and ways of living, they deprive themselves of since forever. Something I firmly believe is that once the first and the second are mastered, the third happens almost organically. The want for sex is transformed into one for plenty of research requiring betterment, and that inevitably requires the development of plenty of the right kinds of habits. The spent on fighting the lost battle with hunger willpower preserved, thus widely available for meaningful things. The water also applies to one's number of daily decisions and other stuff extensively discussed in the earlier mentioned pieces of content. In my humble opinion, that at least partially does what the Kabbalists call getting your animal soul or lower self aka nefesh on board. Often described as a distracted kid, it responds to and craves tastes, smells and pleasures. If not given those, it does everything possible to sabotage your performance, well-being and daily life. Now, whether or not Napoleon Hill's self-discipline somehow automatically meets the nefesh's needs, I really don't know. What I do know, however, is that it definitely stops it from working against the person. So after all, Does discipline equal freedom as we often hear in the modern self-help books? Yes, it absolutely does. As long as you have enough or even a not ending source of the fuels it runs on. And that is precisely what the described by Napoleon Hill's self-mastery ensures. Does this mean that it makes those literally unlimited? That I really can't say. What I can say is that it makes them more than enough. More than enough for what? More than enough for reaching permanency with any positive thought, habit or practice via hypnotic rhythm. 
Hence, it becomes fully adopted and you no longer need using them to sustain it. That includes making the process earliest and most difficult stages way more manageable. And when you go past through the water, those fuels become redirected for other or for more positive practices and habits to be implemented. The definiteness of purpose and the definite chief aim. Closing the door of one's mind against the devil, having definiteness of purpose is the most certain escape of drifting. Also described as the starting point from which to establish your own environment and similarly to building a skill, faculty or even an impressive physique, it develops only through constant and systematic use, or in other words, through absolute perseverance. Beginning with independent thinking, it must be exercised in all areas of life. On the surface, that's being very particular about your goals and arranging everything so it could somehow contribute to their achievement. On the grand scale, however, all that isn't to merely satisfy contemporary desires, but to instead turn all of your thoughts and actions into a perfect sequence. One, to make you live your absolute true life purpose. Called by the new thought tradition, definite chief aim, closest to my mind comes what the Lima defines as true or pure will. What they both define really isn't solely what you want but that you are actually destined for. Therefore, the only to ensure living your full potential and our experiencing the ultimate long-term fulfillment. It is not what some guru, motivational speaker, influencer or pickup artist tries to sell you. Sorry, maybe this isn't what you want, but that you sooner or later start to know that the universe has intended you for. The role it wants you to play in its grand design. To have definiteness of purpose, I think, is to devote yourself to best serving that purpose or playing that role. For Napoleon Hill, that was creating the success philosophy and writing the books we know him for. It requires sacrifices, taking risks, pushing through periods of deep desperation, dealing with anxiety abstaining from pleasure and keep persevering no matter the circumstances, being meticulous about your decisions, alienating yourself from and even possibly dying for others. Maybe it doesn't sound fun nor easy and could even seem not possible. However, I am a firm believer that obtaining the discussed self-mastery makes the impossible quite doable or at least it immensely aids in that on the physical plane. Its three main aspects makes you stop sitting on your own way and operate with definiteness freely. Though not necessary, to most people, the definite chief aim takes time to be discovered, and for that to happen, one must put in charge his or hers other self. The other self. Not part of the actual interview, the book begins with some real-life stories and a rather fascinating subject. Called the other self, the was becomes present during Hugh's challenging period of desperation and lack of faith. Another aspect of his mind, the other self gets the author on the right track, guiding him in fulfilling his absolute true life purpose. Writing and publishing the success philosophy Andrew Carnegie asked him to develop. The other self assures Hugh that everything will turn out for the best as long as instead of fearing and worrying, he has faith and focuses on the tasks at hand. Those orders make the author rediscover not just life and himself, but also failure and even adversity. Then he begins recognizing the third for what it truly is. Nothing more than a temporary defeat and a fresh opportunity to try again. Now, with much greater understanding and higher experience. How that comes to Hill's mind is through an invaluable insight I believe even the best of us should meditate on or at least do so whenever taking a loss. Pages 38 and 203 Quote 
I have also discovered that there comes with every experience of temporary defeat and every failure and every form of adversity the seed of an equivalent benefit. Mind you, I don't say the full-blown flower of success, but the seed from which that flower may be made to germinate and grow. Failure is a man-made circumstance. It's never real until it has been accepted by man as permanent. Stating it another way, failure is a state of mind. Therefore, it is something an individual can control until he neglects to exercise this privilege. End quote. Now, in my eyes, the mentioned experience and understanding are precisely what this seed symbolizes. To some extent, I also believe that kind of gives birth to a popular trend in the modern self-help. To deliberately fail at something as quick as you can, so you can faster get a much deeper understanding of its ins and outs. The other self also revives Hill's perspective on prayer. Rather than begging for something from a position of scarcity and weakness, when praying, he begins incorporating a strong sense of sincere gratitude. Hence, prays with the mindset of an acknowledging and appreciating the already possessed winner, giving him some astounding results that not only makes the author re-recognize all of his blessings, some of which he had temporarily forgotten, but also to be more readily guided and identified by infinite intelligence as a monad of itself. Supposedly, we can safely assume that Hill's other self is actually the main contributor to the book's creation and all of the work we know him for. The more fascinating, however, is that the author reveals us that we all have other selves and that by putting them into operation, we ensure most efficiently serving our definite chief aim. Therefore, also automatically escape the devil's web. Can you even imagine? In the face of prayer, faith and positive thinking, he will also share some of the tools to aid us in achieving that. Undoubtedly one of the most compelling and life-changing things to ever read in a book, I believe that opens doors for a whole different way of self-improvement. Yet, perhaps also leaving some readers with the puzzling question of who or what that other self is. While solving that mystery took me some time and additional reading, to present my answer, I'll have to first clarify something. The meaning with which I'll use the word ego for the rest of this review. Rather than to egotism or self-centeredness, by speaking of ego, I'll be referring to the following. The individual center of conscious awareness, that of the personality through which one perceives both the internal and the external world, the day-to-day consciousness and the I through which one experiences the reality, including emotions, feelings, thoughts, and etc. In other words, I'll be mostly using the term in its Jungian sense, thus speaking of that part of the soul which some of those versed in Kabbalah call Ruach. Having that clarified, let's imagine that one's consciousness is divided into two. Or, as Napoleon Hill says, inside it live two different persons or entities. The first is the ego and the second the other self. Though completely necessary, the first is driven by fear and malleable to the devil's control. The second, on the other hand, is driven by faith and, most importantly, divine guidance representing one's deeper consciousness or true self, depending on who you ask, the last could be seen as one's direct link with his or her holy guardian angel, or divine or higher self, again, depending on who you ask. A.K.A. that part of the soul, which is also part of the divine or the infinite intelligence, thus the person's direct link with it, Telima calls that the cups, Kabbalah names it Yakira or Yakida, meaning that the other self is the single entity within the mind capable of channeling one's highest and intrinsically purest genius, which by the way 
is also mentioned all across Napoleon Hill's teachings, especially those regarding the sixth sense, the intuition and, of course, the sexual transmutation. What appears to be the case in my humble opinion is that the author somehow strengthened that link solely through faith, positive thinking and the other mentioned in his work devices. Alternatively, you can think of it like this. Your other self is your true self, but your susceptible to the devil's influence and control ego wants to usurp and command your entire conscious mind. Where I think something similar is depicted is in the legendary Neon Genesis Evangelion, particularly in its 16th episode, Splitting of the Breast. After losing consciousness during a battle, there the main character Shinji Ikari talks to his other self, revealing some truths about him, those around him and the created by his ego narrative, the last appears in an extremely challenging moment identically to what happens with Napoleon Hill. Yet, Shinji's other self looks like his child version, a symbol of purity and the times when his ego wasn't so developed and maybe he was closer to God. More importantly, however, is that in this scene, Shinji's other self has the sun shining behind his back and above his head as a sphere. Now, what I think that symbolizes is the actual connection with the same Yekida, Keter or HGA, or at least I believe it certainly does when considering the embedded in the entire series Kabbalistic symbolism. Something not mentioned in Outwitting the Devil but set in Ava is that the other self doesn't live only in one's mind but also in those of the others knowing one. A product of Hideaki's Anu genius, that concept, I believe, is another worthy of meditating on. So, to find more about it, I highly encourage watching the anime. Now, it is on Netflix. So, let's get back to the book. Page 48, quote. My conception of the other self, which I have tried to describe, is that it merely symbolizes a newly discovered approach to infinite intelligence an approach which one may control and direct through the simple process of mixing one's faith and thoughts, end quote. Based on that and the entire interview, I dare to suggest that, though only partially, putting into operation your other self could somehow be identical to one of the most significant aims of what's known as the Western tradition of spiritual development. Namely, Obtaining knowledge and conversation of one's holy guardian angel. You don't like those terms? Then great. In that scenario, merely think of the quintessence and source of all genius slash most brilliant thoughts and deeds you'll ever be capable of. Then see your ultimate best version, which the whole self-help industry rants about, as a tiny reflection of that. Now, before experts and authorities want to slap me in the face for what I just said, let me first explain how I made that assumption. Different than the Eastern tradition, which ultimate goal is reaching Nirvana and becoming one with the Divine by getting rid of many aspects of one's soul, particularly the ego, that of the West strives for pretty much the total opposite. Unveiling one's divinity by developing the mind so it could be suitable for that. Or, as some metaphysicians say, transforming it into a cup or a vessel capable of holding the angel's light. How the Western system does that isn't by eliminating, but by bringing into operation more aspects of one's mind and self, if you will. What that includes isn't only the material, the person, doesn't utilize nor is aware of, but also that he or she deliberately suppresses and denies because it neither fits their idealized selves nor their persona. While the first is the plenty of inferiority complexes causing never reachable, fictitious, idealized version the person chooses to compare themselves with, 
The second is the edited mask they decide to show to the world and nowadays mostly on social media. Scared or somehow uncomfortable to be who they really and entirely are, people mistreat and suppress whole parts of themselves. While pushing those deep into the mind's unknown regions prevents one from becoming complete, in the context of the book it equals surrendering them to the devil and even calling him to come and start controlling them. In Jungian terms, the sum total of those would be called shadow or shadow self. Although developing pretty much simultaneously with the ego, the shadow is actually suppressed and denied by the same. Yet, the less embodied or assimilated in the person's life, the blacker or the darker the shadow is. According to outwitting the devil, the less possessed by the person and the more controlled by the devil it is. Sorta identical to Jung's Hellswick or individuation, the Western tradition efforts to integrate all of those so-called not cool or unworthy aspects and make them serve the person's definite chief aim. It encourages and trains people to not only recognize and accept those as theirs, but to also appreciate and even invite them on board so they could also partake in the person's greatest cause. In other words, to somehow contribute to the fulfillment of one's absolute true life purpose. Something which I believe could be also encountered in the phrase conquering one's inner demons or taming the beast within as displayed on the Terror Trump 8. Now, I really don't know about you, but to me, Napoleon Hill's priceless advice of taking inventory of our intangible assets perfectly fits that whole concept. Especially when given in the context of infinite intelligence, the other self, tools like prayer and of course the fact that the devil dwells in the unused portions of one's mind. Page 45, quote, It may be helpful for every reader to take inventory of his intangible assets. Such an inventory may disclose possession of great value. End quote. Similar to most of the book, there are letters of understanding to this one as well, or at least I believe there are. While the first likely is about ensuring you don't waste any skills and talents and maybe tools and equipment or perhaps even stuff you can sell and invest the money elsewhere, the more profound is that of accepting yourself as a whole and making tangible slash putting into operation as much of that whole is humanly possible. The more you do that, the more you move the separating your mind threshold in favor of your other self. Hence, the more you make it grow, so the more powerful and present it becomes in your daily thoughts and actions. In other words, the more appropriately shaped for divine guidance your day-to-day -day consciousness gets. The more you neglect, suppress, deny and refuse aspects of your own self because they do not meet society's ever-changing trends or criteria, nor fit some twisted ideals, the more they start working against you. Thus, they become devil's property. Whether or not you want to accept that, I think the water once more brings us to Jung. According to him, and of course, many others, splitting certain aspects of yourself because you find them somehow inappropriate, shameful, traumatic, offensive, or whatever the reason for that might be, is precisely what creates psychological tension and leads to neurosis. Obviously, it also leads to one or more of the six basic fears. So what I think the key is, is not denying anything of what you already are, but instead making it tangible and using it all to become that you were intended to be. The other self is the mediator or reconciler. Taking control over and even sacrificing one's lower self, it reconciles the ego and the mind suppressed aspects with the person's highest genius making them work together for the greatest good. It's the soul's jump-starting and sustaining alchemical process element. Or maybe even more, the process itself. And while I really don't know anything about Kabbalah, 
nor about its mighty Tree of Life glyph, I suggest this. If we had to attribute the other self to one of the holy Sephiroth, then I believe that should be to Teferet, beauty. The opposites reconciling, mediating link between the person and the divine. Infinite Intelligence As well known as the infinite power, supreme consciousness, the great G or architect, or the universal mind, I.I. could be also encountered in other New Thought slash Mind Causality books. A perfect example of that is another favorite of mine, the written by William Walker Atkinson under the name of Three Initiates in 1908, The Kibalion. What we find in the same is that the universe is mental and it's sourced from the universal father-mother mind. Naming it the universal storehouse of infinite intelligence, outwitting the devil teaches us that by attuning our minds to her and adapting to her woes, we can manifest whatever we want. Pages 117 and 165. Quote. Recognize that your brain is a receiving set that can be attuned to receive communications from the universal storehouse of infinite intelligence to help you transmute your desires into their physical equivalent. End quote. Quote. Infinite intelligence favors only those who adapt themselves to her woes. She makes no discrimination of fine character or pleasing personality. End quote. Though widely unusual, I like to think of and envision infinite intelligence as the Telemic star goddess Nuit, aka the Egyptian goddess Nut, or as the same is the actual storehouse manifesting from what the Kabbalists call Ainsofor or infinite white, aka the three veils of negative existence to be the source of everything and anything and about which we cannot say anything. Actually, as long as I know, it is the second veil. So, to me, that appears as the easiest way to envision that which no one can imagine. Or at least, it's somewhat most comprehensible to a human or a finite mind aspect. Why is that is not solely because Nuit is the infinite space, time and the whole universe, and neither because outwitting the devil refers to I.I. as she. The reason being is because, besides all that, Nuit is also the very infiniteness of experiences and possibilities which may or may not happen. Said differently, it's all potentialities. Also carried within each person, Hadith, aka Nuit's masculine partner or masculine counterpart, is the center point perceiver of all of those events or experiences. Because of that, I dare to suggest that putting in control one's other self could be in fact very identical to attuning one's own hadith to the right possibilities and experiences. The ones which the sum total of makes the person true life purpose or definite chief aim. Then, for the lack of better term, one's consciousness downloads them and the person manifests them on the physical plane through definiteness of purpose while strengthening his or her own inner communion with the eternal soul of the universe. Something which I believe is kinda what the law of attraction also explains. In that way of thinking and of course, besides all else, the devil could be also seen as the sum total of possibilities for one to fail and fall into drifting. As found in all of Napoleon Hill's teachings, a critical role for accomplishing the former plays the imagination. The stronger it is, the more readily those downwards happen, and the more perfect I think the earlier suggested sequence becomes. Part of what I meant when speaking of the other self, I think that opens plenty of room for researching another brilliant mind of the New Thought tradition. Neville Goddard a core belief in his principles is that God is the people's imagination and that the same is what creates reality. Now, before the final words, I believe it is only right to not skip on something very important. Appropriately crediting the spiritual leaders whose work helped me find explications of the last two subjects. 
Wow Dare list undoubtedly begins with Dr. Israel Rigardi, because of who I kinda learned about the others. It also includes Dion Fortune, Dr. Christopher Hyatt, who worked with Dr. Rigardi, the earlier quoted Manly Palmer Ho and Neville Goddard. To get a better grasp of their work, however, also help me podcasts and lectures of the modern day Juan Maiwo Duquette and Dr. David Shoemaker. And though it may sound odd, without mentioning their names, that review wouldn't be finished or complete, or at least it wouldn't be finished to both, my other self and me. Final words. What I think makes outwitting the devil priceless is that it conveys not only some fundamental truths about the universe, but also hints for aspects of some of the most ancient and potent transformational practices and philosophies. Presenting them in a manner understandable to simple, ignorant and non-initiated people like me, it opens doors for a whole new way of self-development. One based on seeking wisdom beyond the scene here and now, yet also deeply within. Moreover, it does that while very elegantly staying in the context we live in and the imposed by organized religion belief system by even employing as a character the same symbol of ultimate evil. Through that, the book reveals the reader the actually harsh reality, namely that whether or not liking it, the former is at war and that is valid from the moment of his or her birth. What that war is against are two things. Number one, the worst qualities of the person's ego. And number two, the existing in one's mind and in the outside world devil's weapons and devices. Aiming to drag one into drifting by enlarging the first, the second group is pretty much omnipresent within our society. The good news, however, is that they cannot work without the person's help. What that reminds us of is the battle's ultimate goal, increasing the possession of one's own mind. How I think that's done is through definiteness of purpose and, of course, by not denying but assimilating more of one's entirety as a mighty, functioning other self. The more that's achieved, the fitter for serving one's definite chief aim the person becomes and the more guided by infinite intelligence he or she gets. Something which despite its utmost importance, I believe a lot of the modern self-help tends to neglect. Thank you for your time. Now, rather than annoy people with those phrases YouTubers tend to use at the beginning and at the end of their videos, I'd like to do something else. Namely, to ask only those who enjoyed this book review to check the work I've done on my website, particularly on this article and on both versions of my latest track, Elemental Equilibration, or in other words, to see me in my entirety as a creator. And now, thank you for your time.